welcome to a new Getting to Know Japan webinar. Thank you for joining us and a big thank you to our sponsor, the Japan Foundation New York, for funding this series and enabling us to put this on each week. Today, we are joined by Professor Peter Shapinsky, who will be presenting on Kaizoku in the Seto Inland Sea. So Professor Shapinsky is a professor of history at the University of Illinois, Springfield. He is the author of the book, Lords of the Sea, Pirates, Violence, and Commerce in Late Medieval Japan, and several articles and chapters, including merchants, monks, and mar murderers, medieval Japan on the seas, on and over the seas, forthcoming in the new Cambridge history of Japan. So, Professor Shapinsky, it is a pleasure to have you with us today, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much for that warm introduction, Amani, and thank you to the Yokosuka Council for uh, Asia Pacific Studies for this invitation to offer a presentation on Kaizoku of the Sato Inland Sea. Uh, so I'm interested um, in the ways in which East Asia was integrated uh, into global systems of commerce and cultural, uh, commercial and cultural exchange in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, and this we usually talking about this as the age of exploration. Um, and I'm interested in the ways in which this integration uh, relied on sort of what we think about as non-state peoples or those who fall uh, outside or live outside uh, or between uh, authorities of various realms, but often acted in conversation uh, with those peoples. Uh, this was the first truly global era of uh, maritime trades. We can think about spices and silks and ceramics and pharmaceuticals thinking the world, bringing new world silver and Japanese silver to China and Southeast Asia. It's a period in which sulfur and saltpeter trades fueled gunpowder empires and in which enslaved peoples were circling the globe. Uh, Japan's most important artery for all of this trade was a 450 kilometer long channel known today as the Seto Inland Sea, which connects the pre-modern capital of Kyoto with the, the Western half of Japan and the rest uh, of Asia. What's sort of really interesting to me about this period uh, is that many of these maritime networks lay outside the grasp of land-based states. And this is a world without many formal navies. Uh, seafaring bands offered, often operated autonomously, militarily as well as commercially, which rendered them pirates in the eyes of observers. And many historians have in fact identified a pirate belt in the early modern world stretching from the Atlantic, uh, you can think about Elizabethan England or the Caribbean, the Mediterranean and East Asia, including the Seto Inland Sea. So the case of uh, Japanese pirates, the Kaizoku of the Seto Inland Sea is significant for this exploration. Because in contrast to many of the, the pirates that we know, such as a, you know, Blackbeard or whoever, um, sea-based uh, sea families in the Seto Inland Sea established themselves as transgenerational dynasties of maritime mediators and lords over maritime communities in space. Uh, and their history in particular shows that although um, we think about lordship or ruling as a, something uh, resolved, uh, reserved for the land, and we often think about the sea as a commons, free for all. Sea lords, uh, these pirates of the Seto Inland Sea, uh, innovated strategies for demarcating and ruling uh, this, the very fluid medium uh, of the ocean. And I'm going to talk about one pirate in particular, Noshima Murakami Takeyoshi, uh, 1533 to 1604, um, whose history enables us to really see concretely the political and cultural mechanisms that seafaring families employed that turned large swaths of the uh, inland sea into territory, um, something that can be administered, something that can be regulated, something that can be divvied up and shared. Um, and to do so, they represented themselves as uh, sea lords. Uh, the term sea lord is not one that appears explicitly in sources. Uh, instead, it describes practices of self-representation uh, engaged in by seafarers. And this is sort of one aspect of history. I'm really interested in the ways in which historical peoples thought about themselves and presented themselves to, to other people. Um, seafarers rejected the array of terminologies. And I can, uh, if there's a question, I can sort of really delve into some of this terminology for pirate. 
uh, that land-based officials and travelers across East Asia use to describe them. And this includes the word kaizoku, uh, which we generally translate as pirate, um, but seafarers never use this word to describe themselves. Instead, they, uh, the noshima uh, arrayed themselves in rhetorics and symbolisms associated with authority, particularly the authority on land that was accepted by the traditional warrior, aristocratic, and religious authorities while retaining for themselves mobility um, and using sea-based uh, protection enterprises and other businesses to project power and regulate territory at sea. They embraced a vision of sea as connection and sea lordship as control over that connective tissue. Um, so I'm gonna begin uh, by sort of looking at one of the most famous accounts of Takeyoshi uh, as a sea lord, which is from the official Jesuit history um, of the Jesuit mission in Japan, which highlights the degree to which he turned parts of the inland sea into his personal lake. Um, that many uh, travelers and authorities understood that without his permission, it was really hard uh, to travel uh, safely. Um, so in 1586, uh, the head of the Jesuit order, the Padre Vice Provincial, set sail to visit uh, uh, the island uh, upon which resides the greatest pirate in all of Japan. He lives in a grand fortress, possesses many retainers, holdings, and ships. And he's continually fly across the waves. His name is the Noshima Lord. He's so powerful that on these coasts, as well as the coastal regions of other kingdoms, all make him annual payments out of fear that he will destroy them. Since our brothers and fathers continuously sail by this island, we always run the risk of falling into his grasp. And so the father vice provincial wished to see if he could negotiate for a way that we might receive safe conduct. He ordered a Japanese brother to visit and the Noshima Lord afforded that brother much honor and hospitality saying that wherever the fathers were favored by the Lord of the realm, Toyotomi Hideyoshi at this time, they did not need his favor. Nevertheless, he fulfilled the request commanding that the father vice provincial be bestowed with a banner of silk bearing his sigil in order that when they encountered a suspicious ship, they would show it to them, which was the greatest favor that he could make. The means by which the, they, the Noshima, maintain their preeminence as supreme pirates in all of Japan lies in that they are a house that has endured for many years. They have accrued a reputation as great lords and are treated uh, and served as such. And so for the rest of the time, I'm gonna sort of trace, uh, sort of take uh, the author of this account, Louis Froish, uh, the Jesuit historian at his word, uh, and look at the ways in which the Noshima were a house that endured for many years to accrue a reputation as great lords uh, and sort of lay out some of the secrets um, Uh, of uh, Noshima Murakami Takeyoshi's uh, success. And these include uh, thinking about lordship as a cultural and political identity that can be performed uh, through an uh, act that we might think of as code switching, uh, sort of switching one's uh, form of communication depending on who one is talking to. Uh, they strategically sought out patrons and acted as mercenaries. They took advantage of their mobility at sea uh, and kept that maritime mobility as an advantage. Uh, they carefully used the geography of uh, places we'll talk about as choke points, narrow channels that the Inland Sea is a sort of famous for. Um, Takeyoshi also inherited a large legacy uh, of ways of territorializing the sea. And key to his success, as, we, as sort of indicated by the account by Louis Freuch in the Jesuit history, is this idea of protection business as key. So, Takeyoshi uh, was born in 1533 in the midst of the so-called era of warring states. Uh, and he and other sea lords really profited from and engaged with, perpetuated the challenges of this Sengoku Jidai uh, with creativity, innovating new structures and hearkening back uh, to olden days as they sort of legitimized and justified uh, what they did uh, using old language. Uh, he inherited the house headship of the Noshima as a child and struggled early on to overcome a succession challenge uh, from another branch of his family. And this sort of really cued him in really early on to the importance um, of uh, uh, it cued him in early on uh, to cultivating his image. 
Uh, and the way that he overcame the succession crisis uh, was he engaged in a political marriage and he called on his patron, uh, the warlord O. Chiyoshitaka, uh, who, um, let's see, he's uh, from far Western Honshu in Northern Kyushu, was really one of the most powerful warlords uh, of his day. Um, and uh, uh, to send aid uh, to ships, uh, aid in the form of ships to help him. Uh, to attract patrons and powerful marriage partners required that the Nojima present themselves uh, as something familiar to uh, land lover uh, warrior uh, elites on land. Uh, and attracting powerful marriage partners required uh, that the Nojima present themselves as worthy. Uh, and this is a challenge because at this time in medieval Japan, uh, seafarers were typically looked down upon. They were thought of as alien sea people. Um, but uh, the Noshima had since the 14th century organized itself in ways really indistinguishable from a warrior house on land uh, using a method of transgenerational corporate familial and political organization that united the head of the family uh, with branch members of the family, other bands, uh, workers, uh, and commoners across the domain. Uh, so in uh, for the case of the Noshima, they have port workers and shipping organizations and fishing and salt producing villages and merchants and, and other sort of literal uh, based peoples, all tied together with uh, hierarchical family bonds. Uh, this means that pirate communities and family based bands uh, included groups of various strata and economic class, uh, and also allows us to read gender roles uh, out of uh, what's going on uh, in these bands, um, uh, so that we see uh, women uh, as well as men are working actively in these sea lord communities. They worked as merchants and fisher folk operating toll barriers. Um, there are even boat people, uh, diving women uh, populations in these uh, uh, areas. Uh, and you know, to sort of give an example, Takeyoshi's wife, uh, who uh, he married another sea lord house uh, uh, to make this marriage alliance work to win his succession crisis, she ended up being a powerful voice in deliberations about patronage and the direction of uh, family policy. Um, and so thinking a little bit then about uh, patrons, uh, so if we imagine like Corsairs in the Mediterranean or privateers in the Atlantic, uh, Japanese sea lords often interacted symbiotically with authorities on land, uh, exploiting patronage for legitimacy to expand business opportunities and to acquire rewards and resources. Uh, and for their part, uh, authorities on land, whether imperial, aristocratic, religious, or warrior, all depended on contracted uh, with piratical specialists for a wide range of tasks from commerce to sea battle, fighting sea battles to protecting foreign envoys. In dealing with these patrons, uh, Takeo Takeyoshi uh, learned uh, again to represent himself as the leader of a warrior house. And he, so then to his title of uh, Lord of Noshima, he would add uh, honorary titles that originated in Japan's ancient Ritsubyo state um, such as the governor of Yamato province. Uh, and these honorary titles sort of cued in uh, his interlocutors uh, that he was someone worthy and understood and part of the larger hierarchy of the realm. Uh, for his part, the patron, uh, Ouchi Yoshitaka, sent aid to, to Takeyoshi during this feud because he really needed the Noshima expertise, protecting his ships, fighting sea battles, administering ports and commerce. Yoshitaka, uh, Ouchi, uh, the Ochi were famous uh, for seeking to extend their control to the capital uh, across the sea lanes and also engaging in maritime trade. And so having uh, these naval auxiliaries really uh, helped them a lot. And so then he sent aid to Takeyoshi to defeat uh, the challenger. Um, and through the patronage of the Ochi, then the Noshima gained access to uh, the access to uh, various Chinese merchants uh, who had taken up shop in uh, the Ouchi domains. Uh, and this enabled the Noshima periodically to engage uh, in wider raiding, trading, and slaving sorties in China and Southeast Asia in the mid 16th century. However, once Takeyoshi had secured supremacy 
and over his band and territory, he embraced the role of mercenary, not vassal. Uh, as Freusch's vivid description of ships flying across the waves suggests, uh, Takayoshi embraced mobility, which enabled autonomy. Uh, he learned uh, the importance of having multiple patrons. Side switching helped ensure autonomy, uh, and it also enabled the Noshima to double their business. In this time of civil war, endemic warfare, the, the, the Sengoku period, the Noshima provided the tools to attack enemies of patrons and their shipping, and then turned around and offered that protection from their own violence for a price. Under Takayoshi, the Noshima maneuvered more than 10 times, shifting between patrons over the course of his long life. They switched sides and fought for multiple sides in the same conflict. And these included the most famous warlords of the day that we we're all sort of familiar with, Otomo Sorin, Oda Nobunaga, uh, the unifier Toyotomi Hideyoshi. All of them accepted this autonomy because of their need uh, for services. And this can be seen in sort of processes of rewards. Um, in this period on land, we think about it as often a period of consolidation as these powerful warlords gathered vassals uh, and uh, um, took them off their little fiefs and stuck them in castle towns where they could be surveyed uh, and controlled. But in the maritime world, even the Seto Inland Sea, which again is at the heart of the archipelago, um, sea lords retained the initiative and the people like Takeyoshi controlled the tempo of patronage even to the extent of dictating their own rewards. Um, and in their rewards they sought were consistently maritime. So many of the places we see here were earned uh, as reward from say the Mori or the Ouchi ter as territories. Um, uh, they also sought um, uh, legitimacy for uh, protection rackets. Uh, for example, when Takeyoshi was still a child, the Ouchi failed uh, to guarantee Noshima exclusivity uh, for a certain protection racket stretching from where you can, it says Shiwaku there all the way uh, to uh, where Itsukushima is uh, today. Um, and so the Noshima abandoned the Ouchi and switched uh, to some of the competitors, the Kono and the Otomo. You can see on the map here. Uh, and so to lure the Noshima back, uh, into his service, Ochi had to promise them even greater uh, rights to extort protection, and this included protecting overseas trade. A couple of decades later, in the 1560s, Takeyoshi danced between the Mori and the Otomo, uh, shifting back and forth, helping to keep uh, the fires of war lit between these two warring houses in order to uh, profit from that warfare. Uh, he gained territories from the Mori and from the Ultimo. He gained the right to extort protection across much of the Kyushu seaboard that you can see on the map there. And in the 1570s, uh, the Mori went to war with Oda Nobunaga. Uh, and again, the Noshima uh, consistently, they uh, led a campaign for the Mori while also uh, engaging in cutting deals with the Oda uh, to gain access to the port of Sakai. And that allowed them really to build this chain of territories that you can see on the map here, stretching across much of the Inland Sea. Uh, the mobility at work in Noshima mercenary activity was also central to their geographical vision of sea lordship. And this begins with the nerve center of their domain, the Sea Lord House, uh, at the, this grand fortress depicted by Freusch was in fact a tiny little island less than a, a kilometer in circumference, even covered with fortifications and ringed uh, by uh, shipyards and docks. Uh, it's now uh, uninhabited today. Um, but in the maritime world, it had a huge footprint, uh, stretching, linking by uh, sea lanes to surrounding islands, ports, and other fortresses. Excavations of this island uh, have uncovered a wealth of pottery, coins, and other artifacts from across East Asia to testify um, that the Takeyoshi's family's influence had rerouted trade routes from other sites of influence in the region uh, and where archeological finds are much more meager. Uh, the advantage of this place is clear uh, as a choke point. Uh, the Inland Sea is famous for sea lanes that sinuously wind among chains of islands, creating narrow channels that have strategic potential for controlling access between basins and regions. Uh, and the Noshima Channel itself is quite famous 
uh, for its tricky currents and tides. You can uh, even take a, a ride uh, to experience those tides today and experience uh, what they call the pirate mood. Uh, and in contrast to travelers and landlubbers who saw the currents as a hazard, the Noshima developed a niche in sailing, fighting sea battles, and navigating tricky tides and currents. These choke points became strategic locations in Sea Lord's eyes for controlling maritime space and traffic. And by fortifying those choke points, uh, they extended influence over other islands and regions. Uh, and so the earliest records of the Noshima actually uh, from the mid 14th century show them extending their dominion, their protection enterprises uh, from their home island to nearby islands, particularly those known as estates, shōen. These are private land holdings run by absentee proprietors. And the history of pirates' interactions with these small island estates enables us to re-envision territories once sort of written off uh, as uh, insufficient for lordship because they don't have a lot of arable land is instead incubators of sea lordship because of potential maritime connections. And Takeyoshi's sea lord forebears adapted uh, practices from these estates uh, that they learned in becoming managers of them. Um, and they gained control over several uh, inland sea estates. And I'm gonna talk about a couple briefly. First is uh, Yugeshima, um, which you can see on the map there. Uh, in the middle of the Inland Sea. Uh, this is a map from the early 14th century before the Noshima really uh, acquired influence there. Um, but it's a, it, it's, a nego it's a sort of cartographic representation of negotiations over who owns what. And what's clear from this diagram is that we see territory being extended off the land uh, through fishing, uh, through the fishing industry uh, offshore and even through maritime trade to nearby islands. Um, uh, Yugeshima was famous uh, for uh, salt production and shipping uh, enterprises that also took islanders offshore into and across the water. They also colluded uh, with uh, people like the Noshima to find nearby markets for their valuable uh, salt. Instead of having to ship it to Kyoto, they would sell it locally and send those proceeds instead as tax. Uh, and so when the Noshima arrives in the mid 14th century in this island, uh, setting themselves up as managers, um, cutting deals to uh, send uh, profits to uh, the proprietor, uh, that was the temple Toji in Kyoto, uh, they gained a lot of uh, expertise in uh, managing uh, these maritime islands and connecting them to other islands uh, in the region. And a century later, uh, ecclesiastical administrators of this island complained that control had been lost to the dominion of pirates. A second estate known as Shiwaku, which is slightly uh, to the east of Yugeshima, uh, became perhaps the most important port and choke point in the Noshima domain. It's located in a narrow choke point, as you can see on the map, between Honshu and Shikoku, and it's one of the busiest ports of the medieval archipelago, in the mid 15th century, uh, the shipping guilds there sent more than 30 ships annually carrying and transshipping commercial goods to the capital. It was a way station where travelers awaited favorable winds, took lodgings and arranged charters and bought protection. It thus functioned as a nexus of cultural exchange. And based on the testimony of some Chinese envoys who visited Japan, uh, this detail uh, of a 1565 Ming Chinese map of Japan represents Noshima control uh, of portions of the Inland Sea with choke points in this representation of Shiwaku, which is, as you can tell is sort of magnified well out of scale uh, as it's, uh, the map maker turns it into uh, a geographical landmark, navigational landmark. And Takeyoshi himself, uh, there are records of his administering the shipping organization based there, resolving disputes and providing protection for its ships. So island territories like Yugeshima and Shiwaku extended the reach of the Noshima beyond their home island uh, through choke points where they regulated access to space. Um, and they did so uh, by doing so, they, they were able to demarcate space that they thought was theirs and space that they uh, said was others um, by establishing toll barriers. And we can think about this much like our modern 
uh, freeway system, capitalizing on the perception of ports and the narrow channels uh, as transfer points, they militarily fought off interlopers uh, and used those choke points as places of negotiation where uh, travelers would uh, buy safe passage and by buying safe passage, recognizing the space where they were traveling in as under Noshima uh, control. Um, uh, Freusch's identification of Takeyoshi as a great lord uh, required that the Noshima be more than autonomous mercenaries or marauders. They needed to have territorial claims recognized by both inhabitants and outsiders, and it was protection uh, that made that possible. Again, this is an age where there's no navy or a coast guard to protect ships. Um, instead, ships carrying everything from salt to shogun to overseas trade relied on private piratical contractors like the Noshima for safe passage. And the Noshima established a reputation as powerful protection practitioners. The protection business took a variety of forms, usually lookouts on fortresses situated on uh, island mountaintops with spot ships and signal anchorages who would dispatch small fast vessels known as barrier ships. Um, alternately, patrons would arrange for protection uh, for those vessels they were dispatching across the inland sea. And anyway, in any case, uh, negotiations over protection became key opportunities for the Noshima to sort of imprint their vision of the sea uh, by performing lordship to those who were seeking safe passage. And so they linked performance of protection with the recognition by uh, external constituents uh, of their lordship. To elicit recognition, uh, the hosting sea lords like Takeyoshi had a variety of tactics. Uh, so in Freusch's account, we saw uh, how he used hospitality, hosting ghosts with civility. Uh, for other visitors, it was a chance to, uh, you know, awe them with his mastery of elite cultural pursuits such as kickball, keimari, or linked verse poetry, renga, uh, or tea ceremony, uh, which then ins inscribed these pirates as legitimate elites in the eyes of 16th century Japan. Uh, and among the fruits of patronage with warlords such as the Ouchi uh, were gifts of artisans or visits by monks to train in poetry and tea ceremony and other arts. However, it's also worth considering the account of a Cholson Korean envoy uh, who traveled through the waters of the Noshima in 1443. And he recounted in a report how our seafarer escorts charged and screamed at us brandishing sticks until the envoy paid them off with more silver a pantomime to extort more in protection money. Uh, to those of lower or equal status, Takeyoshi interpreted the request for protection as a chance to show his superiority, his generosity, trading requests for protection as petitions. Uh, and so the linking of protection uh, negotiations with performance of lordship suggests that a traveler's requests for safe passage represented uh, to the sea lords uh, travelers recognizing their legitimate dominion. Uh, among Takeyoshi's sort of innovations though, was a fundamental transformation of the protection system. He innovated protection for something the Noshima extorted to something others requested. No longer did the Noshima sail out to intercept passing ships. They developed a reputation for protection such that the impetus for protection sprang from elites and travelers from across Western Japan who sought out the Noshima and asked for guarantees of safe passage. And as we saw in the account by the Jesuits, uh, Takeyoshi regularized and institutionalized uh, protection practice, hiding the threat of force behind symbolic markers of Noshima protection in the forms of flags and ships, mobile markers of dominion on the seas. Uh, again, in the account by Freusch, we see him bestowing a banner of silk, bearing his sigil that was requested by the Jesuits. Uh, and in fact, there are many examples uh, of this practice surviving by the Noshima. Uh, the heads of the house, Takeyoshi and his son Motoyoshi, would grant requests by bestowing these flags they called crest pennants, momaku, uh, with their house crest uh, emblazoned vividly in the middle and flown from the masthead. If we think about these as analogs of the Jolly Rogers, symbols flown from ships to be visible from afar, communicating the potent might and reputation uh, and identity uh, of pirates uh, were not too far off the mark. Freusch describes this practice, those on these coasts as well as coastal regions of other kingdoms 
make him annual payments out of fear that he will destroy them. Uh, Takeyoshi had transformed protection from an extraordinary exaction to a routine annual payment. Typically, payment was dispersed at the end of the year uh, for the next year, and the ledger of one family of port merchants, even in this period, uh, has it in its ledger as a gift for pirates. For the Noshima, this request of protection enhanced its uh, potential as a tool of lordship, while those receiving the penance acknowledged the recognition of sea lord uh, control. We should also not ignore the potential economic impact of these practices. Uh, those with Noshima flags paid less in protection costs than those without, and thus gained an advantage. A wide variety of figures from across Western Japan, uh, other daimyo, Jesuits, merchants from the key peninsula, Kyushu, and the Inland Sea all requested flags, seeing them as a good investment. And by turning it into an annual expense, uh, Takeyoshi simplified and made it predictable. Uh, and all of this facilitated then uh, the transformation of the Inland Sea uh, into Noshima space. Uh, and this practice continues uh, well into the reign of uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi. As late as 1586, even after Hideyoshi had begun to pacify most of Japan, uh, the account of Freud suggests that the Jesuits still feared to sail without a Noshima flag in order to travel unmolested. The system also enhances the public character of Noshima's uh, domainal authority. Uh, they perceived uh, the recipients perceived the flags as a guarantee against a wide variety of maritime hindrances, from marauders to the assessment of tolls. However, historically, the right to issue such guarantees, whether in the form of flags or as letters, represented a fundamental appropriation of privileges traditionally understood as the preserve of the highest status land-based authorities, emperors, shoguns, temples. These were the ones who legitimately could... Uh, offer such protections and for the Noshima to do this is a quite uh, an appropriation of their power. Uh, these crest pennants added to practices of symbolism associated with control of the seas. Uh, from their time as managers on estates like Yugeshima, they learned that residents and proprietors laid claim to and sought to administer maritime space by planting poles in the sea. These poles would mark spaces where ships moored and nets hung extending territory into the water, connecting deeper and shallower seas to the work done in those spaces. So by flying the crest pennant on the masthead represented the authority of those who planted the pole. Takeyoshi realized that sea tenure, however, requires controlling the sea, requires mobility. As a medium in constant flux, the sea could only be pinned down by sailing on top of it and presenting a visible symbol of dominion. So attaching the pole, to a moving ship makes that possible. Uh, the ships that the Noshima used to enforce the crest pennant system further conveyed the image of mobile sea lordship. He and his, the Inoshima innovated great ships known as atakebune, what Korean observers call turreted ships, what we might translate as dreadnoughts. Huge warships, these are some of Japan's earliest warships, uh, were lumbering behemoth floating castles used to occupy choke points and blockade ports, thus an, a maritime analog of siege warfare tactics that depended on building fortifications. Uh, the Noshima incorporated castle turrets onto ships, enabling them to borrow from the symbolism of turrets on land, especially those of the central keeps, which in the 16th century, century emphasized the power and centrality of the territorial lord. Uh, the turrets on the ships represented the centrality of the Noshima house, but again, they did so in a mobile way. Instead of fixed castles on land, uh, sea lords turreted vessels dominated seascapes uh, as floating fortresses. Uh, and as these castles suggest, Takeyoshi and other sea lords mastered the art of masquerading uh, as lords on land, using performance to achieve certain ends, including the establishment of patronage relations and legitimacy in a world that otherwise saw them as alien sea people and pirates. With the unification of Japan by Hideyoshi in 1590, Takeyoshi ran out of patrons to play against each other to ensure autonomy, and he instead used his ability to role play as a warrior lord to surrender his territory and autonomy on land in return for positions as a domainal admiral under the mori of Western Honshu. 
enabling them to survive into early modern Japan. Uh, he transformed uh, his family into uh, vassals uh, under the Hideyoshi and the Tokugawa. Uh, he hunted down those the Mori named as pirates and sent forces to fight in Hideyoshi's invasion of Korea. Um, and although Takeyoshi's family survived as elites, the new order of Tokugawa Japan required that his family rewrite their medieval history uh, of sea lordship and project back into the past this idea of them as vassals, overriding their past of autonomous lordship with myths about pirate navies, suigun, that persist to this day. But one legacy continues to speak to us. Uh, and I'll close with this map. Uh, this is a Portuguese sailing map. Uh, a navigational chart uh, from 1568, and we can see uh, several notations for Ilas dos Ladrones, the pirate islands uh, be, uh, that, by which Japan became known uh, in the late 16th and early 17th century, which is one legacy uh, of uh, people like Noshima Murakami Takeyoshi that without his assistance, safe travel in Japan uh, and linking Japan to the rest of the world was impossible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sapinski. Uh, and so uh, the next- Two minutes. Uh, sorry? Ah, okay. Oh, I was two minutes over, sorry. Ah, no worries. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so now we will get to some audience uh, members' questions. Um, so the first question um, I want to ask you is, um, around what time did the value of being um, a kaizoku kind of fade. So you mentioned like the the benefits that the kaizoku provided, um, being you know uh, warlords and kind of controlling um, the Seto inland sea, um, the economic benefits, the benefit of protection. Um, but around what time did this kind of fade or lose value? Uh, professor, you are on mute. Okay, sorry, I don't know how that happened. Okay, uh, yeah, so um, the value of being a, a kaizoku changes uh, in the Edo period uh, where they're unable to uh, sort of actively sail as pirates. Instead, they sort of, uh, it becomes a, a powerful legacy. Um, and there's a lot of sort of mytho history that gets created in the Edo period um, where it becomes a, a marker of pride that you have pirate ancestry, but you're no longer actually actively sailing uh, as uh, as pirates uh, at that time. Yeah, good question. Thank you so much. Um, so um, the next question I would like to ask is from um, Lucy Amaral. So um, the question is, um, so Noshima is like a very small island. Um, was the entire island just a fortress or a castle? Um, it doesn't seem big enough to have like a village or anything. Uh, it seems, yeah, that, that there was a, uh, a castle that was the main residence, and the villages were mostly on surrounding islands uh, where they had, uh, again, they used the sea lanes as connectors uh, of villages um, um, where, they, you know, where they would grow food or they would uh, you know, have markets or access to things like that. I see. So in addition to this question, um, can people still trace their and like pirate ancestry? Yes, yeah, I've actually had people in Japan come up to tell me that their ancestors were pirates. Um, but Japan has a, a long history of uh, genealogical uh, making genealogies, uh, and this flourished in the Edo period. Uh, and uh, as houses like the Noshima and others would uh, sort of record their history and make their genealogies. Uh, and these survive, and then, you know, there's probably a link there to the modern Koseki uh, system of household registration so that uh, people, you know, so people are able to, you know, have that uh, and claim that ancestry. Yeah, good so, question. Um, so that kind of like makes me think or, or want to ask. So, um, you know, uh, we constantly hear about people talking about like their um, ancestry or perhaps like having like a samurai, you know, in their family. So like, what is the, I guess, if, if there is one, what would be the ranking or the comparison to that? So uh, we do know like the value or, or how, um, 
you know, how how the the position of the samurai in, in Japanese culture and in Japanese history. So how would that compare to like say the kaizoku? Excellent. Uh, that's a really uh, good question. Hard to answer. Um, it depends on the on the period. Um, and you know, this is one reason that these kaizoku would uh, sort of play act uh, as and will represent themselves uh, as samurai, right? That they would use the symbolism. Uh, they would try to borrow the cachet of uh, being a samurai uh, uh, to make themselves known to elites on land, something familiar, but also again to borrow from that uh, cachet uh, uh, to you know make themselves look like uh, elites. So I think we can definitely make the, the case that uh, samurai status was uh, something higher uh, in the eyes of most people in Japan, uh, that kaizoku, um, as a term, it meant uh, various things depending on um, how, uh, you know, which period we're talking about. But generally, it was the barometer for the degree to which people uh, could control uh, or not control the seas. And so when they could control the seas, um, it, would, it would just mean sort of banned it. Uh, but by the 15th and 16th century, it was used sort of indiscriminately for uh, both legal and illegal uh, activities. Um, uh, and, you know, but it always, I think, had a, sort of a lesser connotation uh, than sort of warrior lordship on land. I see. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next question comes from John Mensing. Um, so uh, could you talk a little bit about the Battle of Ikushima and the shifting alliances there between the Mori and the Sioux? Sure. Uh, yeah, this is a, a great question. Um, complicated uh, situation. So Sue Harutaka uh, overthrows uh, the Ouchi uh, and eventually goes to war with the Mori, uh, and their big climactic battle is the Battle of Itsukushima. Um, and there are several, um, the, the history is sort of long and, and complex, uh, but there is a debate that, about whether or not, say, the Noshima uh, participated in the battle and which, sea, which pirate or sea lord houses participated uh, in uh, this battle. Uh, and so what we see, though, is the importance of naval auxiliaries uh, to this uh, battle, uh, first of all, I think fundamentally. Uh, for uh, sea lords in the 16th century, uh, they saw this, saw this as one opportunity to sort of play the sue against uh, the mori in order to win the battle. So the, the noshima are actually very cagey, and they end up not participating in the battle. Uh, although many of their allies do, they join on the side of the Mori. However, in the Edo period, uh, looking back, the Battle of Itsukushima becomes one of sort of the most pivotal and sort of mythologized events. It sort of becomes the founding myth of the Mori house, the founding sort of episode that allows the Mori to rise to power. And so those families that had any sort of affiliation with the battle, with, with the Mori in the Edo period, had to sort of invent a history where they participated on the side of the Mori uh, in, in this battle. And so there's a lot of myth-making uh, that gets written uh, and, you know, the, the, that gets written in this period. And so um, Thomas Whits Whitson asked, um, did the Noshima assist Hideyoshi's uh, 1590s invasion of Korea? Um, why did they lose to the Korean Admiral Yi Sun Shi? Great question. Yes, uh, they were in the war. Um, they part the Noshima uh, participated uh, as uh, vassals of the Mori uh, and other houses, uh, Kuki Yoshitaka and the Kurushima Mur Murakami sort of led uh, as admirals their own fleets. Um, why did they lose? Uh, good question. Well, their ships are, are designed for the inland sea. They're not designed for the rough waters off the coast of Korea. Um, they're designed uh, for boarding maneuvers. So uh, the, this, I showed a diagram of the Atake Bune, these huge ships. Uh, they don't travel very fast. Uh, they're quite uh, lumbering. And they're, again, they're, they're sort of the sides fold down so that uh, ship people can uh, leap across uh, to board other ships. 
whereas the turtle ships of East and Sheen are famous uh, for having lots of cannon and being able to, you know, just be uh, really early gunnery platforms uh, that really uh, made short work uh, of the Atakebune, and they knew the waters off the coast of Korea much better, obviously. That's really interesting um, because the picture that you showed of the ships, it, the, the ships look really sophisticated. So it's really interesting that you mentioned um, they weren't built for the waters outside of the Seto Inland Sea. I guess it goes to show, um, you know, in modern times how um, ships have like transitioned from being able to, um, you know, exist in the areas and nearby which they're built to now being able to sail, you know, the open sea. So that's really interesting. Yeah, I also think it's important to keep in mind like what ships are designed for, right? We have all sorts of different designs uh, of ships today. Uh, and the, the Atake Bune, again, it's, it's designed as a blockading vessel. Uh, it's not really designed for mobility. Um, and, you know, so it's, again, as a floating castle, a floating uh, platform. So um, that might also account for it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Vivian Ning asked, um, how vibrant was trade in the Inland Sea at this time? Uh, extremely vibrant. Uh, the records uh, are spotty, uh, but, you know, there's a, a long, there's a, a shipping register from the mid 15th century uh, that talks about, you know, hundreds of ports, uh, sending thousands of ships, uh, you know, through uh, the Inland Sea, engaging in commercial traffic. Um, this is an age where Japan uh, is trading uh, with uh, Korea, China, Southeast Asia. Um, so yeah, the trade uh, is really vibrant. Uh, we see a shift uh, in trade from uh, sort of sending goods in kind to having uh, sophisticated uh, local uh, and regional uh, tr uh, trade, which uh, goods are then transshipped to the capital. So uh, shift in a, a tribute estate economy to a commercial economy is occurring in this period. Uh, and the sea lord is really actively involved uh, in that. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, now, now Aki Oishi uh, asked, how do you see the connection between this Murakami sea force and the development of Meiji era modern Navy? Excellent question. Um, so there's not a direct link, right? That um, the Atake Bune, for example, uh, don't really function after the early 17th century. Um, so, but there are connections um, that, again, it, it, in sort of the realm of ideology and mytho history making. Uh, the Noshima and other pirates are really sort of foundational. Um, that uh, ideas that they were, uh, you know, raiding the coasts of China and Korea and Southeast Asia really become, they become a, uh, what, a precedent for Japanese expansion in the modern period. Um, so that's sort of one legacy uh, on the modern Navy. Uh, another is that if you, you can actually go and research uh, the official sort of Meiji Naval Archive. Uh, it's in the it's a digital archive at uh, the University of Tokyo Komaba Campus Library. It's fascinating uh, in that it's what it contains is sort of these these military manuals that get devised in the Edo period, uh, describing the secret tactics uh, of houses like the Noshima Murakami. Um, they have all sorts of designs of ships and diagrams. Um, and it's really hard to know like how authentic they are. Most of them, I think, are uh, a bunch, uh, you know, a lot of fantasy that gets written in the Edo period. Um, but it, it, they become sort of foundational, sort of this foundational history about the mytho history of the medieval people in the Inland Sea become uh, sort of foundational to uh, the myth making in the Tokugawa period, which again becomes foundational to the way that the, the Meiji Navy uh, writes its past uh, in order to look forward. Uh, to its future. Um, uh, there is one sort of footnote here that it was uh, mariners from Shiwaku, uh, the Inland Sea Island that uh, 
brewed um, uh, Japan's first Western style worship, the, the Kanrin Maru uh, in the 1860s. So there are some, they are drawing uh, on uh, that legacy uh, in sort of uh, envisioning the modern Navy. Uh, so Ed Thompson wants to ask, um, have you come across any evidence of how far they ranged and how they navigated? Um, was this primarily within visual range of land? Um, I assume the propulsion or the oar or sail, and obviously, you know, they would have to have worked with the tide. Right. Uh, yeah, great question. Um, so in uh, for inland sea mariners uh, specifically, uh, yeah, it was a lot of coastal sailing. You're very rarely outside of land, uh, out of sight of land uh, in the inland sea. Lots of narrow channels, and so you're yeah, you're working uh, with the tides and learn knowing the tides and the um, propulsion is again by oar. Uh, the sails are not very sophisticated; they don't tack very well uh, into the wind. Um, uh, but if we sort of take a, a wider view and think about participation uh, with uh, the so-called wako of the 16th century, which the Noshima had some connection to, um, there they're gaining a lot of access to uh, the expertise of mariners from Fujian uh, in uh, Fujian, China, uh, who were, you know, had uh, knew the sailing routes uh, to Ryukyu or today's Okinawa, down to Southeast Asia, uh, who, you know, they have sailing manuals, they understand the stars. Uh, and so from Fujian mariners, I think there was a lot of interchange. Uh, you know, they learned the patterns of seasonal winds, they, they knew the compass, uh, stellar navigation, uh, and things like that. So, um, yeah, so over time, they really learned a whole sort of uh, arsenal uh, of navigational techniques. Uh, so Maria Petru 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 Petrucci um, says, uh, hi, Peter, long time no see. Um, can you tell us more about the wife of Tako uh, Takeyoshi? Um, you mentioned the Oichi, but very little about the Kono. Yes, uh, well, the latter part is mostly for a uh, lack of time. Uh, but of course, they were had close relations uh, with the Kono. Um, uh, his wife is from the Kurushima family. Uh, she doesn't leave a lot of records, but the, the, the most sort of evidence about her seems to come uh, from discussions in 1582 when, uh, hold on a second, my dogs are going berserk. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Yeah, so from in 1582, the Noshima have a choice to make. They can either uh, stay with the Mori or they can uh, join uh, Hideyoshi. And uh, Takeyoshi's son, Motoyoshi, is close to his mother, and the mother seems to have been pushing very hard for them to join uh, the Kurushima, her, her natal family, uh, with uh, uh, joining the Kurushima and joining uh, Hideyoshi. Whereas uh, Takeyoshi wanted to sort of stay uh, independent. And so that's, you know, most of what we know uh, about her. But I think, you know, we can sort of extrapolate uh, from that and think a little bit about uh, if we think sort of wider uh, about gender roles and marriage among daimyo houses in Sengoku era uh, Japan, uh, we can, you know, sort of envision uh, you know, Tabata Yasuko has the argument uh, that both men and women in these political marriages often uh, would work really hard and uh, to make uh, these political alliances function. And so based on that, we can sort of extrapolate and, and guess a little bit about uh, what uh, Takeyoshi's wife and her influence in making the Kurushima Noshima Alliance attempt to function, uh, even though they're, you know, they actually go to war in 1582 uh, there's a breaking of this alliance as the Kurushima join uh, with Hideyoshi, uh, with uh, Noda, uh, Oda and then the Hideyoshi, uh, whereas uh, uh, the Noshima stay with the Mori. So Tom, oh, sorry, so sorry. 
Uh, so Tom Whitson asked, do the Jesuits uh, use the Waco as mercenaries in places like the Philippines and Macau, for example? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, I don't have a lot on this, but uh, certainly Japanese mercenaries uh, were prevalent on uh, Jesuit ships. Uh, many Europeans hired Japanese crew. Uh, the correlation um, uh, with uh, Wako, uh, you know, is something that I definitely need to dig more uh, into. Uh, it's Wako is hard because it's a label for multi-ethnic bands of Chinese and Japanese and even Europeans get sort of uh, mixed in, lumped in with that. Um, but certainly the, the Jesuits, uh, as well as other Europeans are hiring uh, Japanese muscle um, uh, for their uh, actions. Uh, Adam Clulo has written a lot about European use of Japanese mercenaries in the early 17th century. Thank you. Um, so uh, the final question, um, so, there's a there's a narrative out there that exists um, that's a little bit different than yours. Um, it mentions about um, Oichi is a land-based power claiming descent from a Korean prince, strict, strictly controlled by the Shimonoseki Strait. Um, in your opinion, like how do you feel about this, um, or uh, you know, do you have an, you know some kind of opinion about this kind of narrative that exists? Is this the question for, about Tom Conlon's work? Yeah, yes. um, yeah. I, I, you know, Tom Conlon is a, a, a great scholar, and I, I, the problem is that right, the term Sea Lord is, um, you know, I think you can have multiple uh, Sea Lords. Certainly, the Ochi uh, were very active in attempting to. Uh, present a, a vision of uh, Japan that was connected across the seas uh, to Korea and China and controlling trade uh, with Korea and China. Certainly they have a, a vision of descent that includes uh, descent from a Korean prince that they use to legitimize access to trade. Um, other families in the Inland Sea as well, so the Kono House, uh, uh, in their genealogy, they claim ancestry uh, from people who were sailing across uh, and fighting early wars in uh, Korea. And um, but I think you know, looking more granularly at how the Ochi are able to project power, um, certainly the Ochi have ports under their control, like uh, especially the Straits uh, of Shimonoseki. Uh, but they really seem to rely heavily on uh, sea lords of the Inland Sea. Um, so in the Onin War, for example, uh, when they are sailing to Kyoto, uh, the records talk about there are pirates in the vanguard of their fleet. It's not the Ouchi who are leading that fleet. They have pirates, Kaizoku, in, in, at the beginning. Uh, they rely heavily on the Noshima, uh, and other families uh, to fight uh, their sea battles. Um, and so I don't, I definitely agree that the Ochi vision of power uh, of their ruling in Japan is one that in integrates the sea uh, as part of their territory. Uh, but I think that uh, the mechanism by which that was achieved was by uh, often contracting with people like uh, Noshima. Well, thank you once again, Professor Shapinsky, for answering all of the questions and being with us today. Oh, great questions. What a great audience. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, once again, thank you to our program sponsor, the Japan Foundation New York. Uh, lastly, I will uh, present some upcoming events. Bye, everybody. Am I done? I... Oh, <laughs> one more. <laughs> So for uh, the next community conversations event, we have untold, story, untold stories of the black ships visit behind the curtains of Admiral Perry's arrival. Um, this will be in Iwakuni on June 4th, Sunday, June 4th. Um, they will begin at 1230 with refreshments and 1330 with um, the presentation. Um, and Vice Admiral Yoji Koda will be the speaker for this event.
The next uh, Europe and Asia webinar series uh, will be on Wednesday, June 7th at uh, 1900. It's on Zoom. So uh, this will be about South Korea's alignment with NATO. Uh, what does it mean for East Asia security? Uh, there will be three speakers, Dr. Ru Yil Pike, uh, Dr. Hyun Ji Rim, and Mr. Ricardo Villa. Uh, so this will take place uh, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Again, this is online on Zoom. And the next Getting to Know Japan webinar will be on Thursday, June 8th at 1900 on Zoom. It will be about Japan's role in efforts to combat climate change. Uh, Dr. Paul Midford will be our speaker. Uh, so once again, everyone, if you happen to be in the Iwakuni area, please come uh, for, the, for the community conversation uh, in-person event. Uh, if you have time on Wednesday the 7th or Wednesday the 8th to join us for um, our online uh, Zoom webinars, we hope to uh, see you then as well. Um, so I will post the links for the different events in the chat. Um, and once again, everyone, we thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to see you uh, in two weeks for the uh, next Getting to Know Japan webinar series. Thank you, uh, Professor Shapinsky, and thank you to our sponsors and our audience for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye.